On the days when our portfolio go up, we feel good. On the days when our portfolio goes down, we feel extra miserable. And that misery that you feel is what we call loss aversion. It's the whole idea that the misery that we get from losses is twice as big as the happiness we get from the gains. So what I'm trying to say is that there is no way to know when a market correction is going to come. It could come a day from now, a year from now, two years from now, no one really knows. But there are things that we can do right now to make sure that it's not the market taking advantage of us, it's us taking advantage of the market when the market correction do come. And that's what I wanna focus on in this video. Things I've done for myself to make sure that I can take advantage of those market downturns instead of the market taking advantage of me. Towards the end of this video, I'll do a portfolio update as well. And if there are any questions you'd like me to answer in the next video, make sure you let me know in the comment section below or you see any questions that you like, just upvote it so then go to the top and I can see it. As usual, if you learn something new, it would mean the world to me if you could gently smash the like button somewhere around here. And if you really enjoy what I'm doing, consider supporting the channel via Patreon. And of course, no, this video is not financial advice or recommendation to do anything. So without further ado, let's go. So the first thing I wanna talk about is what not to do in preparation for a market correction, because that is just as important as what to do. And as you can see in the chart below, a decline of at least 10% happened in 11 out of 20 years from 2000 to 2019. And more often than not, the average pullback is around 15%. So what this article is really trying to drive home is that stock market corrections are pretty common. Instead of trying to predict when that's going to come, which month is going to come, why not just prepare for it, make sure that we are in the right position to take advantage of it. But the problem with most investors is that they think they can sell at the top and then re-enter at the bottom. And if you don't believe me, check out some of my earlier videos, especially in the comment section below, basically people documenting how they are going to do that. And actually, this is one of the main reasons why I created this video on why new investors lose money and three of my worst investing mistakes. Timing the market is by far one of the biggest one of them. And in reality, what will happen to these investors is that they will essentially sell at some point over here. And then when it peaks, they'll say that market correction is coming. And when it does tank or have some kind of correction, they'll essentially say that I told you so and crash of the century is going to come and we're going to go back to the stone ages, right? But that crash doesn't come and it keeps going up and you'll miss out on this entire run of like 60%. And they'll say that the market is getting really expensive. Therefore, the crash is gonna come any day now, keeps going up, keeps going up, and they never re-enter. Of course, everyone's circumstances are very different. It depends on whether you're in the capital preservation mode or capital accumulation mode. Personally, for me, my investment horizon is still pretty long. So I am in the accumulation phase of my personal finance journey. So from my perspective, I'm just going to get out of my own way and make sure that I stay invested and consistently invest. Timing the market is just not something I wanna do. So if timing the market is what not to do, the question is, what are the things I should do to take advantage of those market opportunities instead of the market taking advantage of me? So the first thing I did for myself is I double check my portfolio and for every single position that I have, I ask myself these two questions. Do I understand what I own and do I know why I have it? Because if I can't answer these two questions, then during a market downturn, it's very likely I'm gonna be swayed by emotion and I'm gonna make some very poor decisions. So for any positions that I can't answer these two questions adequately, I will put a lot more attention to those to see whether I wanna keep it in my portfolio or should I get rid of it and reallocate that capital elsewhere. In terms of how I built my own portfolio, I've documented my entire process in this video right here. I'll leave a link also in the description box below. So feel free to check out that video after this one. The second thing I did for myself to make sure that I can capitalize on these market correction opportunities is to really invest in my ability to generate income. For those of you who have been following this channel for a while, you know I keep beating on this point because most of us are actually quite good at knowing what to invest and how to invest because information is very abundant for those two topics. But people seem to neglect the idea of investing in your income potential. 
During a market downturn, your ability to generate income will equal to the amount of liquidity that you can actually use to invest in things that will give you a lot higher expected return because you're buying things at a discount. And at the same time, if you have a really shaky ability to generate income going into a market downturn, thinking about investing is like the last thing on my list. It's more like survival and making sure that I can pay my bills on time. So the earlier that we invest in our ability to generate income and ultimately having more income to invest, the better it is for a market downturn because you just have more income or excess income to invest. And I'll also add that as your income grow and grow, having the liquidity during those moments to invest is also important. So this is one of the main reasons why I have spare cash lying around, which I call my opportunity fund, that if there's any really good opportunities, I am making sure that I have the liquidity to pounce on it. And finally, one of the things I've been really focusing on this year in preparation for that market correction, whenever that comes, is making sure that I'm taking care of with my mental health and also my physical well-being. Because if you really think about it, life and investing really is all about managing a set of probabilities. And the higher the quality of your decisions, the more likely you're gonna come out on the other end healthier, wealthier, and stronger in general. So this has been a focus for me this year. And yes, I know I have some strong eye bags that I'll hopefully solve in the next couple of videos, but this is something that I'm taking really seriously to make sure that when those market corrections come, I'm in my best shape to make the highest quality decisions possible. Okay, so before I do a portfolio update, there are two questions I really wanna answer. Joshua asks real estate versus stock market as a wealth generator. This is one of the most liked question and I really like this question. So real estate as a someone of an Asian heritage, this has been something that's been basically talked about for every single part or moment of my life. Yes, real estate is a tried and true wealth generator, especially if you learn how to leverage and take advantage of that leverage appropriately. And beyond growing your wealth, there are just tons of benefits when it comes to tax management and also credit scores. But I personally find stocks so much more interesting because I'm learning about business strategy. I'm learning about how you build a team. And this is something that I'm currently doing or I want to be doing in the future. So for me, I just love the stock market. And this is one of the main reasons why I'm not spending as much time on the channel to talk about real estate, just because my interest where I'm currently at in life is more with the stock market. And if you are wondering, yes, my partner and I do have a mortgage on this apartment that we have right here. It's not like we don't have exposure to real estate. It's just, I'm a lot more interested with stocks at the moment. Another great question is what sets good lithium stocks apart from the few great ones? Quality over quantity that was asked by Jeremy. I wrote down a few factors that I think it's really worthwhile considering. And of course, everyone's checklist will be a little bit different, but this is mine. So the first question I like to ask myself is, is this a hard rock project versus a brine project? Because hard rock project tends to get to market faster. And sometimes depending on where the cycle is for lithium, that might get rewarded a little bit faster too. Secondly, another factor to consider is where is the project located? If it's located in a developing country, then obviously the risk is higher. If it's located in a continent that is more likely to encourage EV adoption, that's even better. And if it's a location that's very close to the Gigafactory, well, that's even better because the cost of transporting those resources to the Gigafactories or the battery manufacturers are gonna be so much smaller in terms of cost, so that's great. So location is another factor to consider. Third factor is how's the management team? Generally, the great ones tends to have really close ties with the EV industry and better or more senior they are in terms of being really closely tied to the EV industry, the better, because then that helps attract backing from institutional investors, which is my fourth factor, uh, because institutional investors really are where the big boys writing big checks to help these projects move along. So those four factors are something that I ask myself if I'm looking into lithium companies, but right now that's not part of my focus. So this is a really good time to do a portfolio update. As I'm recording this video, my CMC market portfolio is worth 122,000 Australian dollars. And as I'm recording the video, uh, not too much have changed on this side in terms of my ETFs. It's humming along, I'm happy with it. Asia is doing Asia things, I can't complain. The only thing that's changed on this side of the portfolio is I've allocated half of my cash into Zillow Group. The funny thing is that I encountered this company through learning more about product-led SEO. And this is a company that I really like. I'm not gonna provide too much reasoning on this 
for this video. If you are interested in learning more about it, just let me know in the comment section below. But yeah, this is something that I've added into my portfolio. Short term wise, it's still relatively the same. I'm starting to have a little bit too many positions. So over the next couple months, I will probably clean up my portfolio a little bit because if I add any more, there's going to be too many positions. So I'm very wary of that. So for my stake account, it's currently worth 47,000 USD with 1600 in cash. So altogether, that's about 67,000 Australian dollars, give or take. And not too many changes on this side either. Actually, no changes. Everything is still very much the same other than actually I did sell my Dropbox shares mostly because again, I was just mentioning that I am having too many positions. So I'm just doing some spring cleaning, if you will, to make sure that for all of the high conviction stuff, I will allocate capital to them for some of the low conviction stuff. Then I will ask myself, do I want to keep it in my portfolio? If I don't, then why do I have it? So thank you so much for hanging out with me all the way to the end. If you did learn something new, consider gently smacking the like button right there. Subscribe to my channel, click onto the bell so that when I release future videos, I can let you know. If you're still bored, I left a video on the screen that I think it's incredible to watch next. And as usual, Otto will always do the honors and I'm gonna see you very, very soon 